Okay. Here we go. Today, we are talking about a Russian composer named Igor Stravinsky. He's a modern composer. We call him modern now instead of contemporary because it's no longer contemporary. Contemporary is what's happening in our day. And Stravinsky lived um, from the end of the 1800s into uh, 1964 or something. So he, he now is given the, the title of a modern composer. Here's some vocabulary that you'll need to know. A Moor is a Muslim from Spain or North Africa. And that's significant when we get to our ballet Petrushka. You all know about love triangles. It's in all the books and all the movies. Uh, uh, it just can't be boys and girls just pair off. It seems like one loves one and that other one loves another, and then they eventually have to get it all sorted out. You need to know what a love triangle is. Piano transcriptions is where you take a big piece of music, say written for an orchestra or a string quartet or a trumpet solo, and you turn it into a piano piece. That's a piano transcription, something written for something else that someone writes, a composer writes for um, the piano. The pianola is a player piano. I hope some of you have seen a player piano. Have you? Um, have you had experience with a player piano? They have some now that are um, played by computer. Uh, back in the day, it was very mechanical. There wasn't any electricity to it, but a pianola or a player piano is works into our lesson today. And the final thing is a man or a woman who is wealthy and clever, and they can put together big concerts. They have a talent for organizing and for gathering musicians and for selling tickets and promoting it right. Often they will not only <clears throat> organize these great concerts or um plays or whatever they are they also finance it so that if there's not quite enough money with ticket sales it's so important to them that they put it on anyway so if we talk about an impresario we're talking about a wealthy person who loves the arts now well, it's time to move there we go here are our gospel con academic concepts and gospel principle it's all about igor stravinsky and the gospel principle is about keeping your little light shining. And Stravinsky had a tough upbringing. Um, if he hadn't been strong enough to keep protect his little light of musical genius, it would have just gone out. And we as a world would have been the, the losers in that. So you pay attention to his little light and think about it in your own life. Um, how will you or how will you help others keep their little light burning? So here we have Fyodor, Igor Fyodorovich Stravinsky, born in Russia, probably the most influential modern composer. Um, he was popular in his day, extremely popular in his day, and he's still popular in our day. One interesting thing about him is he was truly was interested in all kinds of learning. He became an expert in English literature and in medieval literature particularly. And uh, he wrote an autobiography called The Chronicles of My Life, where he tried to list all those things that he loved to learn and that he did learn. And uh, we watched a little bit of um, um, The Court Jester. And in the music of The Court Jester, particularly that song, there's a little bit about uh, medieval times. And in medieval time, well, I'll explain it to you a little bit later, but... Uh, um, he was interested in the kind of literature I'm interested in, and so I have another connection to him. When he was a young boy, his parents were busy doing other things, and he often felt um, neglected and kind of pushed aside. His father and mother had dreams for him. They didn't really understand what his dreams were, and, and so he didn't have very many happy memories of a childhood. He, they did give him piano lessons when he was a little boy, and every chance he got to be in contact with music, he was there. It was not like he could buy CDs or download it off the Internet. Often when you're born in the 1800s, 1882, you had to go where the music was. The only music you could be involved with was live music, which is not all bad, but it is more difficult. And that made his life sweet in some aspects is because he was able to come in contact with music. For example, his parents took him to Sleeping Beauty Ballet by Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky happened to be there 
um, he went backstage afterwards and um, was so infused with enthusiasm for music after that that it was kind of a turning point. I guess you could say that that experience gave a little fuel to his light that was kind of flickering some of the time as a little as a little fellow. His parents wanted him to be a lawyer, so they sent him to law school. He didn't want to go to law school, but off he went. He was there four years, didn't attend even 50 classes. He just had no interest in it. Um, fortunately for him, <laughs> there was a war in Russia and finals were canceled. And so it's not totally his fault that he didn't uh, get a degree in law, but uh, he got a half degree in law and was not super happy about that. But uh, his father died shortly after that, and he gave up the law altogether and devoted all of his life to music. He was thinking, maybe I should go to a music school. But, you know, he'd finished law school, so he's not the age of most college students. Well, he met Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, who is um, a leading composer in Russia. It says here he wrote The Flight of the Bumblebee and other fabulous works. He became acquainted with Stravinsky, young Stravinsky, and recommended that he not go to music school, that he was not of the age that could really be benefited by that. He said, you hang with me. I will give you lessons in composition and kind of guide your music learning, whatever else you need to know. He already knew a lot, obviously. He'd won some contests and done really well in other ways. Um, and so that's what Stravinsky did. He didn't go get a music degree or have any formal music training as, an, as a young adult. Um, thanks to Rimsky-Korsakov, it didn't, it wasn't such a bad thing. So where did he live and what did he write? He was born in Russia, as we can see, and you see him there reading a book. <laughs> a lot of his photographs are not at the piano. They are reading books because we know he loved books as well. So he's in Russia. He writes a orchestral work called Fireworks. In the audience is a man, I'm going to get his name right, in the audience is a man named Sergei Diaghilev, and he hears it, and when he shuts his eyes, he sees a ballet, and he happens to be an impresario, a Russian impresario. He's the one who actually started the Russian ballet that is still going today. Well, he went to Stravinsky and said, could you rework the fireworks into a ballet? And Stravinsky did, and um, Diaghilev said, I know it will be successful because I know ballets and I know audiences and I know that it will work. So he rewrote it. They renamed it the Firebird and it was a smashing success. And Stravinsky was on the front news of mus musicology in Russia. But there was war in Russia. And so he moved to Switzerland. He went to Switzerland and eventually moved to Switzerland. He wrote three pieces there that were also turned into ballets, the Rite of Spring, Polsanella, and Petrushka. And Petrushka, we're going to watch a little bit of Petrushka, one of his very famous ballets. Um, he went, he, while he was in uh, Switzerland, uh, the Russian government just confiscated a lot of his work and he got no royalties. And so money started to become an issue. He moved to France about this time and um, he met a man named Playella. And he was a piano maker, and he manufactured, and he actually put together this player piano that you're looking at now. Uh, Stravinsky, in order to put food on the table, made transcriptions of all of his ballets so that someone could play it on the piano, or they made rolls with perforations that they could put in that player piano you're seeing on the screen here, and the piano could play it. Near the end of the lesson, if we have time, I'll let you listen to um, Alexander's Ragtime Band that Stravinsky transcribed for piano and uh, it uses more, often Stravinsky's transcriptions had more notes playing on the piano than a pianist would have fingers on their hands um, and fortunately the, the Bosendorfer that we'll see at the end it's in the module has I think 10 or so extra keys on the piano so there's enough keys to play his songs and they are rich and full and awesome while they were in France the sadness there was a sad chapter in Stravinsky's life these are his four children here's the oldest Fidor and Ludmilla and then Solima and Maria while they were in France 
mama, Katrina, contracted tuberculosis. While she was expecting Maria, in fact, she contracted tuberculosis and uh, had it while, when Maria was born. During that time, Ludmilla contracted tuberculosis, and so did Igor. Sadness, tr uh, Katrina died, Ludmilla died, Igor recovered, but his mother also died all about the same time, with just in a year or two of each other. It was a very sad time in France. And then when he was finished with his France stay, he had three children. He did remarry and was very happy uh, as far as marriage, but he missed Ludmilla. She, she might have been um, very close to him. He very much missed her when she died. Let's see. Moves to America. And he comes to Los Angeles. Um, one of the things he's asked is to uh, write a symphony for C for a orchestra called the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. I had no idea it was as big a deal as it was. He made connections with musical people there and ended up lecturing at Harvard and enjoyed America so much that he moved his family over. Became an American citizen, lived in Los Angeles for quite a while, and actually died in New York City, but um, enjoyed America and became a citizen. Uh, he met a man named Robert Kraft, which when you hear of Stravinsky's interpretations of his music, you will often see Robert Kraft's name um, involved because he was very close to Stravinsky and seemed to understand his music more than a lot of people. And when someone wanted to understand Stravinsky after Stravinsky died, they would go to his friend Robert Kraft. But he had friends, and he had much to do in America. You, know, you can look in YouTube, and you can see Stravinsky leading his own pieces at this age. You see he's a fairly older man, and he's just a little fellow, but he could lead right up until not long before he died. And he died very suddenly, in fact. They were quite surprised. Now, here we get to the court jester. He's in the United States, and, and you know, I, I searched and searched for details on his influence on the music for the court jester, and I could find very little. But I do know that one day they were recording, and when I, I tell you they do this music in the old-fashioned way, they had the orchestra, the, the studio orchestra right there, and the guy is ready to conduct, and the red light is on, meaning we're going to record, don't come in, and he's got his hands up, but the orchestra are all looking over at the door, so he turns over and looks, and here is this little Stravinsky who walks in. And he watches the recording session, and uh, afterwards he, he goes up to uh, Sean, who wrote the score, and said, you have broken all the rules. And he said it with a smile, and that's all he said. I don't know what, what contact they had before. I wish I did. I would love to. But because I know a little more about Stravinsky, I love the court gesture even more. Um, he was a medieval literature and uh, drama expert. And if you go back to uh, even Shakespeare, they'll have the little monologue at the beginning or the end, and they will include in the monologue the directors and the music writers and the stagehands and things not really related to this, the story of the drama. And in the song we listened to at the beginning, Life Could Not Better Be, they mention the all the other peripheral people that are involved in the movie. And they even mention um, literature from back in medieval times and Renaissance times. And so you watch Court Jester after you learn about Stravinsky and see if you can't see the effects of Stravinsky on that movie. Now Stravinsky dies when he's 88 in New York City. The world was very sad. The music world was very sad. They really felt like he had actually moved music forward so that music didn't die out. Now, romantic music, the romantic era of music was wonderful, but it was best when it was new. And an era cannot last beyond its normal lifespan before it kind of loses its pizzazz, maybe. Well, Stravinsky is the one who, who brought music back up into something new and fresh and wonderful. He was very gifted, very creative, and very determined. Um, and so these are some of the quotes of, of people who um, uh, loved him and loved his music and appreciated 
his addition to classical in the big umbrella kind of music. Now, he died in New York, but he wanted to be buried in Italy in this little San Michael Cemetery, which is an island, a man-made island in a lagoon in the north of Italy near Venice. Now, his wife would eventually be buried there with him, but why would he choose Italy? He never really lived in Italy. He, Italy did perform his ballets like many countries did, but Sergei Diaghilev was buried there. And he is that Russian ballet impresario who first helped Stravinsky get his big start by listening to fireworks at the first major performance and went to him and said, could you work that up into a ballet? which would be one of Stravinsky's greatest gifts to the world. His greatest talent was in reworking these pieces into gorgeous ballets. And so maybe that's why he decided that he wanted to be buried in that particular cemetery in the north of Italy. Now, let's talk about these orchestrations that were turned into ballets. Um... First, we have the Firebird. I don't know how many of you have read through this. I'm going to just quickly tell you what the story is, then we're going to watch part of it. The, this ballet, the Firebird, the Firebird is neither male nor female. It is an it, if you talk to Stravinsky. But in the ballet, it is a beautiful ballerina. So the, the, this story is of a hero, Prince Ivan. He enters a kingdom that is ruled over by a wicked Kashki. As he's wandering the garden, he sees a Firebird. And like, I don't know, you tell me, a little boy walks outside, they sees a turtle, what is the first thing he wants to do? I pick up the turtle. Pick, pick up, up the, the turtle. turtle. He wants to catch it. And that's what Ivan wants to do. He chases a firebird and he catches her. And she, is, of course, does not want to be caught. And so they make a deal. If she, she will give him a feather and promise that if he ever needs her, he waves that feather, she will come and help him. He turns her loose. Next, he sees some beautiful princesses. He falls in love with one of them. There are 12 other princesses. There's 13 altogether. He asks that princess to marry him. But as soon as that romance starts to get thick, the wicked Kashki comes out and tries to disrupt it. Just as Prince Ivan is going to be overcome by this evil Kashki, he pulls out that red feather and waves it, and the firebird comes. And the way she solves the problem is she starts to dance and gets all of the wicked creatures dancing just ridiculously energetically until they are totally worn out. And when they are worn out and fall down, she tells Ivan, if you want to destroy Kashki, there's a big egg and it's there. You get that egg. If you break that egg, Kashki will be destroyed and that will be the end of awfulness in the kingdom. Sort of like a Sleeping Beauty story, only... Um, because the whole kingdom has gone to sleep, sort of, except those princesses. Well, he does. He finds the egg. He breaks the egg. Evil is dispelled. The whole kingdom comes to life. And uh, he, of course, marries the beautiful princess. All 13 or 12 other princesses, their sweethearts come alive. And they are all go off into, you know, it looks actually like, well, you'll see it at the end. It's very beautiful. You'd you think they're going off to the temple to marry. It's so very beautiful. That's the story of the Firebird Suite. Now, I'm going to I'm going to find it, and we're going to watch a little bit of it. Here we go. We're starting kind of after he's been in this forest, and you can see that it's dark and gloomy, and this one has got lots of pyrotechnics in it, but the ballet work in this first part is beautiful. You know that... Female ballet dancers are on their toes. They do a lot of spinning. The men do a lot of jumping and lifting. And I want you to pay attention to how fabulous these dancers are, not just the two main ones, but all of them. Um, but partic oh, particularly, well, you just watch this. Here comes the firebird for the first time. And there is Prince Ivan. Very Russian, blonde hair, blue eyes. Yeah. 
Watch the bird movement. I want you to listen to the music. Sometimes shut your eyes and see if you can see what Diagolev saw in his mind when he first heard the music. Everything seems to be asleep and covered with cobwebs. Gonna catch her. Oh, that naughty little boy.
Oh, I missed the feather. I want to see if you Oh, she gave him a feather. Now she's leaving. Little fire thing in his hand. Next, he's going to meet the princesses and choose one, fall in love with one, and be attacked by Kashki. We're going to go over to where he is being attacked and uh, needs to pull that feather out. These are all the evil creatures. She's going to whip them all up. All those monsters are going to be dancing so fast now that they can't hurt anything. And I'm going to take you right to the Infernal Dance from the Firebird by Stravinsky, one of the two famous pieces in this ballet for music. Here we go. This is starting. The Infernal Dance. I'm going to skip ahead now to the other famous part of this play, and that is Versus, or the finale, when all the bad are bewitched, and she begins the most beautiful, telling him how to get rid of evil, and that evil is gone. Now I've got to go back just a little so you can hear the piece. This is Versus, or the finale to the Firebird Suite by Stravinsky. You are lucky, Haley, to have heard a symphony play this.
Okay, here we're jumping to the finale. I hope you watch it. Okay, here now. They're waking up. like a celestial city back there. And it looks very beautiful at the box. brass here at the end. The whole exciting part of the ballet is right here for the brass. Hello all and welcome to Music Minute, the hot theory guide to learn those extra concepts the oh, right way. We right. actually are going to talk to him just a second. So there you are. Um, that song is especially happy for me. Um, I know maybe some of you have heard a symphony play that, but when I was your age, I played in an orchestra, the Idaho Falls Symphony Orchestra, and we played Stravinsky, um, the whole, the whole Firebird Suite, the whole from beginning to end. And about the only time my trombone played was at that very, the very last wedding scene where they all come together and we had those big, long, blaring brass notes, um, and it was wonderful. It was so fun to be there and play. It was worth waiting a half an hour for us to play our 16 measures or 36 measures or however much it was. It was wonderful. So next, why do I keep doing that? What I want to do Hello, is... Hello, and welcome to Music Minute. The hot thank you, kind of Stephen. I'll have you in just a jiffy. This is... No, that's not what I want. This is what I want. Okay, next we'll talk about the Petrushka Ballet. And I want you to listen for the Petrushka chord in this, in, in, oh, I didn't write the whole thing. Let me tell you the story right quick. This is three puppets who come to life um, at a Russian festival. And 
there's a moor and a ballerina and a puppet. There are actually all three puppets, but one is called a puppet. Both men, the moor and the puppet, fall in love with the ballerina. The ballerina falls in love with the moor. Petrushka has left nothing. And so, of course, the ballet is about him who is the underdog. How can he fight against this strong, valiant moor that she's already in love with? So the Petrushka chord, I'm gonna, uh, I'll let you listen to Steve, that guy who keeps trying to talk, is the one who will tell you what a Petrushka chord is and what it sounds like. You listen for those notes in the ballet, and you'll know that Petrushka is on the stage. Um, you will see when a drum roll comes, Petrushka is kicked out of the ballet. He eventually escapes just in time to save the ballerina who doesn't want to be saved, and he is beat up again by the Moor, and the Moor eventually uh, kills him with a uh, scimitar. And in the and so he's laying on the ground in the throes of death, and it's scary to the people around because he just keeps moving. He doesn't look like he's dying. And so the magician, who you'll he's the one who opens the curtains on the stage and introduces you to the three puppets. Um, he goes and picks Petrushka up and shakes him so that all the people know he's just a puppet. He's just made of straw. There's nothing to him. They're all comforted and they exit the stage. The magician takes that straw-filled puppet, looks up on the stage, and there's Petrushka above the stage, alive. And so you're left to wonder who really is alive and who's really magic. And so we're going to listen to part of this ballet. Um, if I can remember how to get where. First, we'll listen to the Petrushka chord. Okay, go. Mr. Steven. Learn those extra concepts the right way. Brought to you by StevenJacks.com. My name is Steven. Today we're going to be talking about something that Igor Stravinsky made popular. The Petrushka Chord. Who names their kid Igor? <laughs> so the Petrushka Chord is popularized in the ballet called Petrushka. Go figure. So the Petrushka Chord consists of two major triads placed a tritone apart from each other. For example, C major and F sharp major. This way you get two major triads, but they're related in a very dissonant way. It's like having ice cream and a turkey sandwich, both awesome of themselves, but you put them together and it's kind of weird. Wait, that would be like having an ice cream turkey sandwich. I gotta try that. Here's what this chord sounds like. The way this chord is written in the ballet is more like this, which sounds like this. This theme was a light motif that sounded whenever the character Petrushka would appear, hence the name the Petrushka chord. Technically speaking, this chord is only valid if you have a C major triad and an F sharp major triad played together. But personally, I believe in equal transposition and therefore having like a D major triad with an A flat major triad would result in having a Petrushka chord as well. Okay, now when you get to your piano, I want you to try this. Look over and see. It's an F sharp major chord and a C major chord. F sharp major has three black keys. This, the C major chord has three white keys. You don't play them on top of each other. You play them in, well, however you play them. You'll hear them all, all different kinds of ways in our play Petrushka. Um, this video you see right here is in the module. If you want to listen to that again and do some experimenting of your own. Um, oh dear, did I, I think I erased the wrong one. All right, let's go to Petrushka. And here we go. This is a Shrovetide Fair in Russia, in the town of Russia. Nuryev is a famous Russian ballet dancer. The man here is extremely famous. Russian dancing in this one. Is that what you like about it, Emma? All kinds of true Russian dancing. Ballet isn't always toe dancing, and you'll see more ballerinas in here. 
Okay, we're moving to the magician who comes out. Now, this is the stage that's going to open, and you're going to see the three characters. We can get the magician to please open the curtains. After he entertains them all. He says, get back, get back, get back. And he's opened the curtains. Yes, Annika, I do too. I like it when they balance on their heels. difference in the feet of the moor and the feet of Petrushka. She's deciding. The magician gives him a stick and says, hit that old moor. And she's made her choice. For the, the drum roll changes scenes and listen for the Petrushka chord as Petrushka is cast out of the bazaar. There it is right there. That's the first one. Now, we're not going to have time to watch this whole ballet. I'm going to turn the volume down. And I want you to think about what the world would be like without Stravinsky's music. What would we do if he had let his little light go out? We've only watched a touch of it. In the module, you'll see the script to both plays, to both ballets, the Firebird and Petrushka. I hope you read those and watch these ballets from beginning to end. They're only between 35 and 40 minutes long each. You could watch it in your family home evening. It's good cultural experience for even young men, young women to actually watch this and, and uh, learn to appreciate a dish, different kind of uh, entertainment. Okay, goodbye Petrushka. We're going to let you go because I want you to see, let's see right here. Elder Packer would say, so what? 
We've learned about Stravinsky and we've watched parts of two ballets. We've learned some of his hardships, his sorrows in France and having to change countries four times. He was citizens of three, Russia, France, and the United States. Uh, life was not easy for him. Um, and so Elder Packer would say, so what? We have to learn something from that or why even know it? So I have two scriptures here. I want you to read Alma chapter 12 first. Is there someone who would like to read that out loud to us slowly while we think about what happens to the light we've been given, what happens to our gift? Um, this is oh, well. okay. Great. One second. This is uh, Alma and Amulek speaking of Zoram, and uh, it's that little event in the Book of Mormon. So go ahead and read. It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the, oh, sorry, to the portion of the word which he doth grant unto the children of men according to the need and diligence which they have unto him. And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts to them it is given the lesser portion of the word, until they know concerning his mysteries. And then they are taken captive by the devil and led by his will down to destruction. Now, this is what is meant by the chains of hell. Okay, is there someone who can tell me what is meant by the chains of hell? What is meant by the chains of hell? Satan has control over you. Ooh. Okay. Say that again so I can hear it. Say it one more time. Satan has control over you. Or and how does that happen? Is this Rodney that's talking? Yeah. Rodney, how does that happen? We start believing what he says over what Heavenly Father would have us believe. Yes, right. that is, yes. And so who puts the chains on? We do. Pardon me? We do. We do. That is exactly right. Up here, he's talking about Zoram and everyone who is, I mean, Zeezrom, not Zoram, Zeezrom. He's talking about Zeezrom, and he says, when people stop listening to the truth or stop doing good, they know less and less until they know how much? Nothing. Nothing. And they don't even know they know nothing. And Zeezrom is hearing this with his legal mind, and he sees that that's true. And that's what worries him. That's one thing that has to worry him. What if I have shut myself off to where I am knowing so little that I don't even know how much I don't know? The second verse says, what does verse 10 say in the opposite? He that receiveth more, uh, accepts it, he gets more and more. Until... until until, Until what? He knows it. Until he knows it all. Now that's an interesting, so you look at the people around you who seem to not want to do what's right and they, they do, their lives are in chaos. Do they even really know why? Or are they at the point where they know less and less and less until they have no idea how to get out of the mess they're in? And until they start listening and want to at least want to know they'll not get to where you are or where someone who's trying to do what's right is. And that's the chains of hell. And people with the chains of hell on them have put them on themselves. And I just, to get them off is a lot of work. 
Now, let's go to Doctrine and Covenants section 50, verses 24 and 25. Is there someone else who would like to read those two verses? I can. Please. That which, that which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light continueth in God, receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. And again, verily I say unto you, and I say it that ye may know the truth, that ye may chase darkness from among you. Okay, can you explain, Rodney, maybe you can or someone else, what is the process then of growing a testimony? What is the process of growing a testimony? Either it's taking it from nothing, bringing it to something, taking it from something and making it more. What is that process? It's a very slow process. It is a slow process. It's a little at a time. It said even Christ had to do it a little at a time. So I could show you an example I could show you. Okay. You guys remember that piece of chain mail I showed in art class? See I see chain mail. You guys remember that when I shared, sh showed a little piece, you know, just, just this big in art class? So that chain mail is made of individual rings. Let me just demonstrate this. Okay. Each one is this. Then they're linked together in this little pattern, four and one. Then you link them, a bunch of them together to make a belt. And then you put those belts together. And our testimony is like that. It's one act. Yes. One act at a time built on several acts over time and it grows so slow. But once you have it done, it's, it's really heavy and it's really strong and it won't fall apart. And if you guys know, if you guys study a little bit about the armor of God, he says, gird up your loins with truth. Now your loins in battle is your back. If you don't want to get hit in the back, you're going to get paralyzed. And so we guard our selves, our back, with our testimony, with truth, with things we know. And you notice that. You can study the armor of God, but he refers to that. He's like, guard your back with truth. So... Knowing your testimony is very important. I just had to relate that I've been studying that quite a bit. I appreciate that a lot. Rodney, why then is death red, death bed repentance not what it's cracked up to be? If it's as much work as you say, and it's happened slowly, little by little, what is with death bed repentance? You're going to have a little belt. That's it. You remember? This... Go ahead, Rodney. Go ahead. <laughs> This piece weighs about eight pounds, probably more than that. But you cannot just make this much in a day. I've probably put 24 hours at least, maybe more, of just going like this over and over and over. And it's not done. It just covers my front little bit and the back. Oh, wow. Wow, so. wow, wow, wow. Well, I think of Constantine and how, how fabulous he was in his own mind, and he did a lot of good in the world, inadvertently in many ways. But he didn't want to be baptized a Christian until the day he died, because he wanted to continue to sin. And he wanted to be all washed clean right before he died, when he had no other chance to sin. And I think you're right, Rodney, he won't have much chain mail to cover him and protect him from the evil that could happen. So how do you think light 
chases darkness away. Does anyone have any ideas on how light can chase darkness away, as this scripture says? I see some mics on. If anyone has something they'd like to say, how does light chase darkness? I know some of you all go to early morning seminary, and I remember one time, and our seminary was very early. It was like 5.45, and it was dark most of the time when we got to seminary. And when we left, we used to say dark morning or, or dark, what would we say? Um, good morning, only they wouldn't, it wasn't morning hardly, it was still dark. And we had a lesson on light and darkness. And our little tiny seminary room in Lebanon, Kentucky, was the only thing we could see that was light. Outside our church building was black, dark. And so I told him, I'm going to go open that window. When I open that window, that dark is so, there's so much of it out there and so little of light in our room that it would just fill our room with darkness. And uh, we wouldn't be able to see anything. And so I prepared him for this horrible thing that was going to happen. And I opened the window and no darkness came in. None. Our room was as light as it had been before I opened that window. And I can tell you that that is true. Now, let me let you see one other slide. And this, whoops, I want the next slide. Oh, this is what I want right here. Um, we were going to listen to this. You can listen to Odette. Um, she's, she's a singer and uh, a narrator, and she reads this beautifully. I'm just going to read the very first part. Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shirking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine. And if we think of Stravinsky saying, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Who am I to write music? I should just hang with the law. Nobody wants me to be a composer. No one really cares about what's inside of me now. I'll just go to law school and that'll be it. But who are you not to be a composer? If there's music in you, who are you not to let it out? So um, I, I would like to bear testimony to you of how significant it is. Whoops, why do I keep doing that? I guess this is the one I want to stay. You search inside of you and find out what it is that makes you shine and just keep it there. Fortunately, you're members of the true church and you have families that love you, obviously, or you wouldn't be homeschooling and being in this class. Uh, but if you ever feel like you're, you, someone has tried to extinguish you, I want you to be as strong as Stravinsky. And remember these gorgeous ballets and the Petrushka chord and the uniqueness of modern music that kept classical music fresh and exhilarating and not the same old, same old. And I bear that testimony to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, does anyone have any other thoughts? Will you look through that module and watch these ballets from end to end? And, uh, some of the other music that's in there so that you can really understand. And when you hear Stravinsky somewhere else, you'll hear the Petrushka chord sometimes in cartoons. When the odd person comes on the stage, you'll hear the Petrushka chord. In some movies, you may hear the Petrushka chord. Uh, I want you to remember that that was Stravinsky, Stravinsky to the max. And uh, uh, so do that. The quiz is already up there. Take the quiz quick before you forget the information. And I will see you then in three weeks. Arts will be starting um, not this week, but next, the following Friday. This Friday will be um, geography, same time uh, with um, Mr. Ribaldi. So, all right, Nathan, would you give us a closing prayer? And I'll see you in a month.
Almost. Yes, sir. Thank you, Nathan. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day we have had to come to music class, and please bless us to have the Spirit to be with us. Please bless us to be kind of loving our constant attention. Um, we know all things come from me, and please bless us that we can do the lesson and the quizzes and the assignments. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Nathan. Thank you all. Appreciate you all.